Yes, friends. Now let us talk about the amendments with regard to registration chapter. Now, when I say registration chapter, so basically one of the first concept is when you talk about interstate taxable supply of goods. I think everyone is aware that there is section 24, and 24 very clearly talks about the compulsory registration point. So it provides the list of the persons who are compulsory required to get themselves registered. And in that list, one of the first point is a person who is making interstate taxable supply of goods is compulsory required to get himself registered. But when I say a person who is making interstate taxable supply of services, then he is not falling under the compulsory list. That amendment has been already brought in 2017. That if you supply services, you are eligible for that 20 lakh limit or 10 lakh limit as the case may be. And if you are dealing in goods, you are falling under the compulsory list. However, a new change has been brought. A new thing has been uh, included in this, which says that yes, prima facie, if you make interstate taxable supply of goods, you need to get yourself registered compulsorily. But the important part is which goods you are supplying. So, if you are dealing in something which is handicraft, this is the point which I am referring to. If you are supplying handicraft goods, or there is a second point which says that the goods which are predominantly made by the craftsmen using handwork then in that in both these categories you don't fall under the compulsory list at all main wapas bol raha hu a person who is making interstate taxable supply of goods is compulsory required to get himself registered there is no option available however there are two exceptions to this point the first exception says that you are dealing in handicraft goods so if you are dealing in handicraft goods so even if you make interstate taxable supply of goods you need to compulsory get yourself registered no answer is no other than handicraft goods and other than those goods which are made by craftsmen if you make interstate taxable supply of goods you need to compulsory get yourself registered but if you are dealing in any of this product which is handicraft product or goods which are made by craftsmen predominantly made by using hand even if machinery has been used as a part of the process that's okay but in predominantly it should be made using hand if yes then any of these two products which you are supplying you don't need to get yourself registered on compulsory basis so this is the first point which says person making interstate taxable supply of handicraft goods that is amended from 26 july 2018 and the second point which we i'm talking about is a person who is making interstate taxable supply of notified products when made by the craftsmen predominantly products when the when made by the craftsmen predominantly by hand even though same some machinery may also be used in the process so that is important point that if you are dealing in any of this product now what is important is they say if you are dealing in handicraft products you don't fall under compulsory list now let us say i deal in multiple products and one of the product is handicraft and if i make interstate taxable supply of handicraft goods okay i don't fall under that uh, list but the important point is well along with other products i am dealing in handicraft what about those other goods if i am making interstate taxable supply of such goods i'll fall under the compulsory list but if i am only making interstate taxable supply of handicraft products then i don't fall under the compulsory list similar way this says those products which are made by craftsmen predominantly using hand work then in that case again i don't fall under the compulsory list now again the concept over here is let us say i am a craftsman and i am making certain products and i am making interstate taxable supply of that so i don't fall under the compulsory list assuming i don't deal in any other product which falls under the compulsory list but now the important perspective is let us say i am a craftsman i made certain product i supplied to a trader and that trader is making interstate taxable supply of goods whether he is required to get himself registered compulsory answer is still no because they have not said only a craftsman who is making interstate taxable supply of goods is eligible for exemption they said any person who is supplying goods which have been made by craftsmen using hand work then in respect of such goods you don't fall under the compulsory list so craftsmen are the people who make this but if they don't themselves make interstate taxable supply they provide this goods to traders in traders makes interstate taxable supply of goods then in that case it is still not covered under the compulsory list so handicraft goods and goods made by craftsmen these are the two exceptional cases which are not falling under the compulsory list baki hamara law bahut clear hai ki agar aap interstate taxable supply karoge to you will always fall under the compulsory list now there is in same line like this is one of the exceptional amendment which has been brought in same way there is another amendment which has been brought under the ctp category it is exactly same 
as we are aware that if you are working as a casual taxable person in some other state, you need to get yourself registered on compulsory basis. Yes, I think everyone you are aware that as a casual taxable person, if you want to operate in any other state, then you need to go you need to compulsory go and get yourself registered. But again, if you want to work as a casual taxable person for this two kind of product, one handicraft goods, another products made by craftsmen. If you want to work in any of this product, then in that case, you don't need to get yourself registered on compulsory basis. But only for these two products, for all other products, you need to get yourself registered on compulsory basis if you wish to work as CTP. So, man, look, a Gujarat ka koi banda hai, wo Maharashtra ke exhibition mein participate karne jata hai, usko Maharashtra mein registration lena hi padta hai. But agar man lijiye ke wo handicraft goods ko leke Maharashtra mein exhibition mein participate karne jata hai, to he is not required to get himself registered on compulsory basis. Acha, man lijiye. कि हैंडीक्राफ्ट और नॉर्मल गुड्स दोनों को लेके वो एग्जीबिशन में जा रहा है तो बिकॉज़ ऑफ हैंडीक्राफ्ट ही डज नॉट रिक्वायर टू गेट हिमसेल्फ रजिस्टर्ड कंपलसरी बट फॉर अदर गुड्स ही नीड्स टू गेट हिमसेल्फ रजिस्टर्ड ऑन कंपलसरी बेसिस उसके लिए कोई ऑप्शन नहीं रहेगा अच्छा सेम वे क्राफ्ट्समैन के लिए होगा कि क्राफ्ट्समैन ने कोई प्रोडक्ट बनाए हुए अगर उन प्रोडक्ट के साथ वो खुद सीटीबी uh, कैटेगरी में काम करने जा रहा है या फिर वो गुड्स किसी ट्रेडर को दे रहा है और वो ट्रेडर सीटीबी कैटेगरी में कोई और स्टेट में जाके ऑपरेट करना चाहता है तो दे डोंट रिक्वायर टू गेट देम सेल्फ रजिस्टर्ड ऑन कंपलसरी बेसिस सो जो प्रोविजन इंटरस्टेट टैक्सेबल सप्लाई ऑफ गुड्स के लिए आया वही प्रोविजन सीटीपी कैटेगरी के लिए भी आया कि इफ यू वांट टू वर्क एज सीटीपी आई मीन कैजुअल टैक्सेबल पर्सन देन यू नीड टू गेट योरसेल्फ रजिस्टर्ड कंपलसरी बट इफ यू फॉल अंडर एनी ऑफ दिस टू कैटेगरी यू डोंट नीड टू गेट योरसेल्फ रजिस्टर्ड ऑन कंपलसरी बेसिस सो आई थिंक एवरीबॉडी अंडरस्टैंड दिस टू अमेंडमेंट्स बोथ ऑफ देम हैव बीन ब्रॉट विद इफेक्ट आई मीन ऑब्वियसली इन पोस्ट जुलाई 2017 आई मीन 2018 रादर so none of them is applicable none of them was applied in november 18 but both of them are applicable in may 2019 so both these amendments under registration chapter are very very important there is over and above that there is one clarification also and that clarification is mainly related to a chapter called casual taxable person again so casual taxable person ke registration ke regarding hi एक और अमेंडमेंट है राधर अमेंडमेंट नहीं एक क्लेरिफिकेशन है सो लेट अस ट्राई एंड टॉक अबाउट दैट क्लेरिफिकेशन यस फ्रेंड्स द क्लेरिफिकेशन इज ओनली इन रिलेशन टू लॉन्ग रनिंग एग्जीबिशन सो आई थिंक लाइक एज आई वाज टॉकिंग अबाउट इज अ गुजरात ट्रेडर गोज टू महाराष्ट्र एंड पार्टिसिपेट इन एग्जीबिशन फॉर फ्यू डेज देन ही नीड्स टू गेट हिमसेल्फ रजिस्टर्ड इन दैट स्टेट ऑन टेम्पररी बेसिस फॉर विच ही ऑप्टेन्स अ रजिस्ट्रेशन अंडर द कैटेगरी ऑफ कैजुअल टेक्सेबल पर्सन बट अ क्वेश्चन कम्स एज वॉट अबाउट द लॉन्ग रनिंग एग्जीबिशन मीनिंग देर बाय अगर मान लो कि हम कोई स्टेट में जा रहे हैं जहाँ पे हम एग्जीबिशन में पार्टिसिपेट करने जा रहे हैं बट दैट एग्जीबिशन इज फॉर अ लॉन्गर पीरियड टू बी प्रिसाइसली इट इज फॉर मोर देन वन एटी डेज पीरियड सो इफ दैट एग्जीबिशन इज फॉर अ लॉन्गर पीरियड देन आई थिंक एवरी वन इज अवेयर दैट सी टी पी कंसेप्ट शुड नॉट बी अप्लाइड फॉर दैट रीजन इज वेरी क्लियर वेन यू टॉक अबाउट कैजुअल टेक्सेबल पर्सन सो यू नीड अ टेम्पररी रजिस्ट्रेशन बिकॉज यू आर गोइंग इन दैट स्टेट ऑन टेम्पररी बेसिस नॉट ऑन लॉन्ग टर्म बेसिस एंड इनफैक्ट अगर आप सी टी पी में अप्लाई भी करोगे तो इन इनिशियल फेज वेन यू मेक एन एप्लीकेशन यू हैव टू प्रिस्क्राइब द पीरियड फॉर विच यू वॉन्ट द रजिस्ट्रेशन वे द मैक्सिम पीरियड इज नाइनटी डेज एंड अगेन वो नाइनटी डेज एक्सपायर होने को आए तो यू कैन डिमांड फॉर एन एक्सटेंशन बट एक्सटेंशन कैन अगेन बी ऑफ मैक्सिम नाइनटी डेज so on a higher side your period of registration can go up to 180 days now if you are going for an exhibition in a state where the exhibition is going to be there for a very longer period maybe more than 180 days period then in that case i think you need a permanent registration in that state rather than you need a temporary registration in that this is what we are referring to okay registration of participant on long run exhibitions so when long running exhibitions are there for that the concept of casual taxable person becomes irrelevant this is the clarification which i am talking about which has been brought from october 2018 and since it is october 2018 obviously not applied in november 18 exam but is definitely relevant for the may 2019 exam in fact batao char panch din late ho gaya hota to ye may 19 ke liye bhi applicable nahi hota seedha november ke liye apply ho jata but the point is since it is prior to 31st october 2018 it is definitely going to be applied for may 2019 exam so just keep this in mind that when you are going for a uh, exhibition if it is long running exhibition then you don't need a ctp category registration rather you need to obtain a permanent registration so keep this in mind that you have to go for a long uh, i mean you have to go for a normal registration 
so this is one of the point that we need to keep in mind see it has been very clearly mentioned is in case of long run ex running exhibitions the taxable person cannot be treated as ctp and thus such person would be required to obtain registration as a normal taxable person further it has been clarified and this is important it says while applying for normal registration the said person should upload a copy of allotment letter granting him permission to use the premises for exhibition reason because you need to have a proof of that document i mean like i think everyone is aware that when you apply for registration so you have to provide uh, that the premises for which you are obtaining registration obviously that will be an exhibition center ground hoga ya koi एग्जीबिशन हॉल होगा या वट एवर सो उसका उस जगह का आपको लोकेशन लेना पड़ेगा तो उस पॉइंट पे अगर आप उस जगह का लोकेशन लोगे तो क्या वो आपका ओन्ड प्रिमाइस है विच कम्स एज अ नेचुरल क्वेश्चन यू विल से नो क्या वो आपका रेंटेड प्रिमाइस है विच अगेन कम्स एज अ नेचुरल क्वेश्चन आंसर वुड बी नो सो देन वॉट सो दैट इज वेयर दिस वुड कम इन के वो प्रिमाइस ना मेरा ओन्ड है ना रेंटेड है बट दैट हेज बिन अलॉटेड टू मी फॉर द एग्जीबिशन पर्पज उसका एक लेटर होगा वो लेटर आपको अपलोड करना पड़ेगा एंड अकॉर्डिंगली दे विल ग्रांट यू द रजिस्ट्रेशन विदाउट दैट नो बडी इज गोइंग टू ग्रांट यू रजिस्ट्रेशन रीजन इज योर प्लेस ऑफ बिजनेस हैज टू बी रजिस्टर्ड एंड दैट प्लेस ऑफ बिजनेस विल बी दैट एग्जीबिशन हॉल और वो एग्जीबिशन हॉल पे मेरे को रजिस्ट्रेशन लेना है तो मेरे पास कोई ना कोई डॉक्यूमेंट होना चाहिए जो मुझे ये बताए कि ये प्रिमाइस मुझे बिलोंग करता है मे बी एज ओन मे बी एज रेंटेड मे बी एज अलॉटेड और समथिंग एल्स बट यू नीड सम सॉर्ट ऑफ डॉक्यूमेंट्री एविडेंस so that is where this document has to be uploaded so i think everybody understand this particular issue with regard to the long running exhibitions but i think yahi ek uh, relevant point tha apart from the two points that we have discussed under the registration chapter other than that friends registration chapter ke liye koi amendment nahi hai so let us try and look at the uh, main subsequent amendments under the other chapters yes friends uh, now let us talk about the refunds with regard to i mean uh, amendments with regard to refund chapter now basically there are only two three points that we need to consider more or less they are nothing but a clarification only except one point where we talk about the 1000 rupees limit for uh, uh, the claiming of refund but let's not go into that as of now we'll take up at the last point uh, one of the first point that we not need to talk about is just a clarification which has been brought uh, last year that is march 2018 obviously it has been applied in november 18 but because it is relevant we'll also talk about that for may 19 exam and that very clearly says that if you are talking about refund on account of uh, exports so zero rated what we says because you make a zero rated transactions without payment of tax so your credit remains unutilized and because of which you are eligible for refund now the important aspect is let us say we import a material on which we charge base, on which we pay basic custom duty as well as we pay gst component and then then we use that material in manufacturing of process goods and then we export the process goods so when we export the process goods there are two points that we need to keep in mind one is when we export process goods we are getting an incentive under two acts one is customs another is gst when i say customs we will get an incentive of what we called as uh, duty drawback under section 75 and when i talk about gst we get an incentive or what is called as uh, refund so now when i talk about incentives under both the acts so that is where the duplication comes in for which the clarification has been brought in which very clearly says that aapko gst mein refund to hi milega when you have claimed drawback only with regard to basic custom duty main repeat kar raha hu aapko gst mein refund to hi milega when you have claimed drawback only with regard to basic custom duty so when i say maine goods import kiye the us time pe maine basic custom duty bhara tha along with that maine igst bhi bhara tha to jo igst ka component hai uske liye mujhe credit leke gst mein hi refund lena hai और जो कस्टम ड्यूटी का कंपोनेंट है वेर वी टॉक अबाउट बेसिक कस्टम ड्यूटी तो उसके लिए मुझे कस्टम में ड्रॉबैक मिलेगा बेसिक कस्टम ड्यूटी के लिए मैं सेक्शन 75 ऑफ कस्टम्स एक्ट में ड्यूटी ड्रॉबैक लूंगा और जीएसटी के लिए आईजीएसटी के लिए मैं जीएसटी एक्ट के अंदर रिफंड लूंगा कीप दिस इन माइंड अगर जीएसटी एक्ट के लिए या जीएसटी के लिए आप कस्टम्स एक्ट में ड्रॉबैक ले रहे हो देन इन दैट केस आपको जीएसटी में रिफंड नहीं मिलेगा मैं वापस बोल रहा हूं अगर जीएसटी के लिए आप कौन से एक्ट में रिफंड ले रहे हो कस्टम्स एक्ट में रिफंड या ड्रॉबैक ले रहे हो तो आपको जीएसटी एक्ट में उस जीएसटी के लिए कोई बेनिफिट नहीं मिलेगा एंड व्हिच इज लॉजिकली करेक्ट ओनली फ्रेंड्स 
कि एक ही अमाउंट के लिए आप ड्यूअल एक्ट में थोड़ी बेनिफिट ले सकते हो कि अगर मान लीजिए कि आपके इंपोर्ट पे 10 परसेंट बेसिक कस्टम ड्यूटी था और 18 परसेंट आई था तो 10 परसेंट के लिए आप ड्यूटी ड्रॉबैक लो अंडर कस्टम्स एक्ट और 18 परसेंट के लिए आप आई का रिफंड लो अंडर जीएसटी एक्ट यू कैन क्लेम बोथ दी थिंग्स आप एक ही चीज के लिए कस्टम एक्ट में भी रिफंड मांग रहे हो और उसी चीज के लिए आई जी एस टी एक्ट में भी रिफंड मांग रहे हो तो कि दोनों पॉसिबल नहीं है फॉर बेसिक कस्टम ड्यूटी यू क्लेम ड्रॉबैक अंडर सेक्शन 75 एंड फॉर आई जी एस टी यू क्लेम रिफंड अंडर जी एस टी एक्ट अगर आई जी एस टी का आपने कस्टम एक्ट में कोई इंसेंटिव ले लिया लाइक ड्रॉबैक तो अब उसका ड्रॉबैक मिलेगा तो आपको उसका जी एस टी एक्ट में रिफंड नहीं मिलना चाहिए सो आई थिंक दैट इज द पॉइंट विच इज नथिंग बट अ क्लेरिफिकेशन विच हेज बिन ब्रॉड सो दैट वॉज इंपॉर्टेंट टू डिस्कस आई थिंक एवरी वन इज क्लियर विद दिस लेट इज लुक एट टू मोर चेंजेस अंडर द रिफंड प्रोविजन Yes, friends. Uh, now, one of the second point, which is actually the most important point uh, under the refund amendments, that is with regard to the refund formula. So, I think everyone is aware that when you are making zero-rated supplies, so your credit remains unutilized, and for which you apply for the refund. For that, uh, we have to find out the maximum amount of refund using this formula, which very clearly says turnover of zero-rated supply of goods. Plus turnover of zero-rated supply of services divided by adjusted total turnover multiplied with net ITC. Now, in each of the point, there are certain things which are very very important. When I say net ITC, so what do we mean by net ITC? So that has been defined. It says ITC availed on input and input services during the relevant period. So whatever ITC that we have availed during the relevant period with regard to input input services, so capital goods ki ITC ki baat nahi hogi. बट इनपुट इनपुट सर्विसेज की आईटीसी अब वेरी क्लियरली वहां पे बोला है अदर देन आईटीसी अवेल्ड फॉर विच रिफंड इज बीन क्लेम्ड अंडर रूल 89.4 ए और अंडर रूल 89.4 बी नाउ कम्स अ क्वेश्चन एज व्हाट डू वी मीन बाय 89.4 ए एंड 89.4 बी बिफोर वी डिस्कस दैट 89.4 ए एंड 4 बी लेट अस डिस्कस वन मोर एस्पेक्ट दैट इज व्हाट इज द मीनिंग ऑफ टर्नओवर ऑफ जीरो रेटेड सप्लाई ऑफ गुड्स एज़ वेल एज़ व्हाट इज द मीनिंग ऑफ टर्नओवर ऑफ जीरो रेटेड सप्लाई ऑफ सर्विसेज So let us try and talk about that. So here comes turnover of zero-rated supply of goods. So it says value of zero-rated supply of goods made during the relevant period without payment of tax under bond or LUT. Again comes other than the turnover of supplies in respect of which refund has been claimed under Rule 89.4A or under Rule 89.4B. So at every time 4A 4B is coming becoming a problem. So in net ITC also 4A 4B is problem. In turnover of zero rated supply of goods is also a problem. It, it, if you say turnover of zero rated supply of services, sir, क्या उसमें problem है? No, answer is no. क्यों उसमें problem नहीं है? उसका reason बहुत clear है कि it is actually goods transaction. ये जो 89.4A है, 4B है, ये goods के transaction के regarding है. तो obviously उसमें ये चीज problem नहीं होगा क्योंकि हम लोग बात कर रहे हैं turnover of zero rated supply of services. अच्छा चलो एक और पॉइंट डिस्कस करते हैं देन वील टॉक अबाउट व्हाट इज 89.4 ए एंड 4 बी दैट इज एडजस्टेड टोटल टर्नओवर तो एडजस्टेड टोटल टर्नओवर क्या होगा तो दैट इज बीन आल्सो डिफाइंड द के टोटल वैल्यू ऑफ ऑल द टर्नओवर्स इन अ स्टेट और अ यूनियन टेरिटरी एंड बेसिकली इट्स अ वेरी क्लियर पॉइंट इन रिलेशन टू गुड्स एज वेल एज सर्विसेज एंड टर्नओवर ऑफ जीरो रेटेड सप्लाई ऑफ गुड्स एज वेल एज सर्विसेज व्हिच विल अगेन बी काउंटेड बट अगेन एक्सक्लूडिंग द सेम कांसेप्ट where we say that 894a and 4b should be excluded so in every point they have very clearly said that out of every issue in net itc you don't talk about the itcs which are related to 894a and 4b transaction in your uh, i mean turnover regarding zero rated supply of goods you don't count that turnover which is related to 894a and 4b in your adjusted total turnover again you don't count the turnover which is related to uh, Uh, I mean, uh, 89.4 A and 4 B. So basically, they are very clear that you don't consider any turnover which relates to 89.4 A or which relates to 89.4 B. That is should be kept completely out of the picture. Now comes an important aspect, and that is what do we actually understand by 89.4 A and 4 B? So here we talk about 89.4 A, and here we talk about 89.4 B. Now let us first talk about 89.4 A actually. सो so, ये भी एक रिफंड का ही प्रोविजन है बट यहाँ पे हम रिफंड क्लेम कर रहे हैं अंडर द डीम्ड एक्सपोर्ट्स ट्रांजैक्शन सो फॉर एग्जांपल लेट अस से एज एन एस एस इफ आई एम मेकिंग बिजनेस आई एम मेकिंग टू टाइप ऑफ ट्रांजैक्शन वन इज एन एक्चुअल एक्सपोर्ट ट्रांजैक्शन अनदर इज अ डीम्ड एक्सपोर्ट ट्रांजेक्शन ना वेन आई से एक्चुअल एक्सपोर्ट ट्रांजेक्शन तो उसके लिए रिफंड मांगने का जो प्रोविजन है वो हम अभी पढ़ रहे हैं 
और वेन आई से डीम्ड एक्सपोर्ट ट्रांजेक्शन तो उसके लिए जो रिफंड मांगने का प्रोविजन है वो आता है रूल एटी नाइन फोर ए से नाउ द इम्पॉर्टेंट एस्पेक्ट इज जितने आपने डीम्ड एक्सपोर्ट्स के ट्रांजेक्शन किए होंगे उसके लिए आपने रूल एटी नाइन फोर ए में ऑलरेडी रिफंड क्लेम कर लिया होगा तो वाई डू यू वॉन्ट टू कंसिडर दैट टर्न ओवर इन कैलकुलेटिंग एक्सपोर्ट रिफंड फॉर्मूला मैं वापस बोल रहा हूं देखिए फ्रेंड्स मैं एक्सपोर्ट कर रहा हूं अलॉन्ग विद दैट मैं डीम्ड एक्सपोर्ट भी कर रहा हूं जब मैं एक्सपोर्ट कर रहा हूं तो उसके रिफंड के लिए मैं ये रूल अप्लाई कर रहा हूं जो हम लोग अभी पढ़ रहे हैं और जब मैं डीम्ड एक्सपोर्ट कर रहा हूं तो उसके रिफंड के लिए मैं रूल एटी नाइन फोर ए अप्लाई कर रहा हूं तो जो डीम्ड एक्सपोर्ट के ट्रांजेक्शन है जहां पे मैं रूल एटी नाइन फोर ए के हिसाब से रिफंड मांग रहा हूं तो उस टर्नओवर को मैं क्यों एक्सपोर्ट के फॉर्मूला के अंदर कंसिडर करूं सो so, मुझे वो टर्नओवर को एक्सपोर्ट की फॉर्मूला के अंदर काउंट ही नहीं करना है और वो टर्नओवर को भी मुझे जो डीम्ड एक्सपोर्ट वाला टर्नओवर है वो भी मुझे एक्सपोर्ट की फॉर्मूला के अंदर काउंट नहीं करना है एंड मोर इंपॉर्टेंट उसके लिए जो इनपुट इनपुट सर्विसेज होंगे उसका जो आईटीसी होगा वो भी मुझे रूल एटी नाइन फोर ए में ऑलरेडी रिफंड मिल रहा है तो वो मुझे ये एक्सपोर्ट की फॉर्मूला के लिए काउंट करने की जरूरत नहीं है दैट द सिंपल प्रोविजन सो वेन आई से कि मेरा जो टोटल टर्न ओवर का फॉर्मूला होगा उस टर्न ओवर में मैं रूल एटी नाइन फोर ए वाला टर्न ओवर नहीं बताऊंगा सेम वे मेरा जो जीरो रेटेड वाला टर्नओवर होगा गुड्स का उस टर्नओवर में भी मैं डीम्ड एक्सपोर्ट यानी एटी नाइन फोर ए में जिसमें मैं रिफंड मांग रहा हूं वो टर्नओवर नहीं बताऊंगा और मेरा जो आईटीसी का पॉइंट है वो आईटीसी में भी मैं टोटल आईटीसी क्लेम करूंगा बट जो एटी नाइन फोर ए में जिस इनपुट इनपुट सर्विस के लिए ऑलरेडी मैंने रिफंड ले लिया है मैं उसको काउंट नहीं करूंगा तो बेसिकली मैं हर एक जगह से डीम्ड एक्सपोर्ट वाला टर्न बाहर निकाल दूंगा अप्लाइंग रूल एटी नाइन ए Let us talk about 894B. So 894B में कौन से ट्रांजेक्शन काउंट होते हैं तो आगे रेफरेंस दिया हुआ है दो टाइप के ट्रांजेक्शन का द फर्स्ट ट्रांजेक्शन इज दो इन रिस्पेक्ट ऑफ विच नोटिफिकेशन फोर्टी वन बाई टू थाउजेंड सेवेंटीन और फोर्टी बाई टू थाउजेंड सेवेंटीन हेज बिन क्लेम बेसिकली दिस इज मर्चेंट एक्सपोर्ट ट्रांजेक्शन एंड द सेकेंड वन से इज वेर क्लैरिफिकेशन और नोटिफिकेशन सेवेंटी एट बाई टू थाउजेंड सेवेंटीन ऑफ कस्टम्स और सेवेंटी नाइन ऑफ टू थाउजेंड सेवेंटीन ऑफ कस्टम्स हेज बिन क्लेम्ड now they are actually considered as ftb based transactions whereby you talk about an eou category or advance authorization or epcg scheme category let us try and analyze that so when i say uh, this first one that is 41 by 2017 or 40 by 2017 which talks about the merchant export transactions so when i in capacity of merchant making an export transaction then in that case my whatever inwards are there in respect of which the taxes have been charged for which i am already going to claim benefit but for that i don't need to consider this particular formula so for example uh, let us let us put it this way i am a merchant and i am making an export transaction for which i have acquired certain goods so the goods that i have acquired on which the taxes have been charged so when i say the taxes have been charged at i mean like the rate is very clearly 0.1 percentage so on my purchase side i have considered 0.1 percent taxes so on my purchase side i when i have considered 0.1 percent taxes it is with a condition that my normal taxes ke rate se purchase nahi kar raha hu to wo jo mera turn over hai wo mujhe ye formula ke andar calculate karke incentive lene ki zarurat nahi hai रीजन रीजन फ्रेंड्स क्या है पता है या तो मैं 18 परसेंट टैक्स चार्ज अठारह परसेंट टैक्स के साथ परचेस करूं गुड्स और मैं फिनिश गुड्स को एक्सपोर्ट करूं और 18 परसेंट का रिफंड मांगू एज पर दिस फॉर्मूला और एज अ मर्चेंट एक्सपोर्टर मुझे बोला है कि वो क्या पॉइंट वन परसेंट टैक्स से परचेस कर लो मैं रिपीट कर रहा हूँ ये चीज को देखिए फ्रेंड्स ध्यान से समझ लेना है when i say as a merchant exporter general option which i have is i can buy goods on which 18% tax has been charged usme se main finished goods bana ke use export kar dun aur wo 18% ki credit agar unutilized rehti hai to main uska refund mang lu as per the original formula which we are discussing the other option is mujhe un purchase ke upar 18% tax nahi bharna hai so i can buy those goods at a 0.1% tax following notification 41 by 2017 0.1% tax and when i am buying with 0.1% tax that means i am claiming special notification and when i claim special notification under rule 49b to ab mera purchase ke upar jo tax hai na wo itc ki formula mein aayega jo 0.1% ka tax hai jo na itc ki formula mein aayega itc ke point mein aayega na hi mera jo turnover hai wo turnover of zero rated supply of goods mein aayega na hi wo total turnover mein aayega wo pura 
पूरा का पूरा ट्रांजेक्शन मेरे एक्सपोर्ट के फॉर्मूला से ही बाहर निकल जाएगा नीदर आई कंसिडर एज पार्ट ऑफ नेट आई टी सी आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट पॉइंट वन परसेंट टैक्स विच आई पेड ऑन परचेज आई नेवर कंसिडर दैट एज पार्ट ऑफ माई आई टी सी एंड द टर्न ओवर विच आई एम जनरेटिंग विल आई नेवर कंसिडर दैट एज पार्ट ऑफ माई टर्न ओवर ऑफ जीरो रेडेड सप्लाई ऑफ गुड्स एज वेल एज एज पार्ट ऑफ टोटल टर्न ओवर सो दैट इज वेयर वी टॉक अबाउट दिस मर्च एंड एक्सपोर्ट ट्रांजेक्शन Now comes 78 by 2017 and 79 by 2017. Friends, ये वो पॉइंट है जहाँ पे actually speaking मुझे IGST का exemption मिल रहा है. माने, so कि अगर मैं EOU हूँ या अगर मैं advance authorization या EPCG scheme में काम कर रहा हूँ under foreign trade policy, तो मेरे purchase के ऊपर tax होगा जो import के time पे मुझे भरना होता है as basic custom duty plus IGST. So, वो IGST वाला कंपोनेंट ही एग्जम्ट हो गया है एग्जम्पन हैज बीन एक्सटेंडेड अप टू थर्टी फर्स्ट मार्च 2019 जो लोग एफ टी बी पढ़ चुके हैं उनको ये पता होना चाहिए कि एग्जम्पन खुद ही एक्सटेंड हो गया है अप टू थर्टी फर्स्ट मार्च 2019 and since uh, uh, i mean since the igst exemption has been extended up to 31st march 2019 so ab kaun sa tax rahega pata hai import ke upar to ke basic custom duty rahega kyunki uske sath jo igst aur gst compensation ses ka point hai wo to extend ho gaya exemption so wo rahenge hi nahi to ab purchase ke upar only basic custom duty rahega wo basic custom duty ke liye to aapko drawback claim karna hai so that means gst mein hai to aapko uske liye koi benefit milne wala nahi hai तो क्या अगर जीएसटी में उसके लिए कोई बेनिफिट नहीं मिलने वाला है तो क्यों उसको एक्सपोर्ट की फॉर्मूला में ले रहे हो सो इम्पोर्टेंट इज परचेस के ऊपर टैक्स तो जीएसटी का तो होगा ही नहीं ना कस्टम ड्यूटी होगा बट वो उसका क्रेडिट मिलेगा नहीं तो आईटीसी वाला जो कंपोनेंट है उसमें तो हम जीएसटी का अमाउंट डालते हैं तो आई में तो कहीं आएगा ही नहीं कुछ नहीं आएगा क्योंकि मेरा जो नेट आई का अमाउंट रहेगा एज पर द फॉर्मूला विच वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट इज दिस इज फॉर्मूला या नेट आई में मेरे को जीएसटी लेना है बट जीएसटी तो है ही नहीं क्योंकि इंपोर्ट के ऊपर जीएसटी तो एग्जाम हो गया सो so, अगर जीएसटी नहीं है यहाँ पे तो फिर मैं रिफंड किसके लिए मांगू और अगर रिफंड ही नहीं है तो फिर ये दोनों में मैं क्यों उस टर्न ओवर को कंसिडर करूँ क्योंकि मैं मैं अग्री करता हूँ कि मैं टर्न ओवर को यहाँ पे कंसिडर करूंगा तो मैं आई के लिए टर्न को कंसिडर करता हूँ अगर परचेज पे आई ही नहीं है क्योंकि वो एग्जाम है तो आई है ही नहीं तो फिर मैं वो आई टी सी यहाँ पे लूंगा नहीं तो फिर टर्न ओवर में भी ये टर्न ओवर काउंट करने की जरूरत नहीं है जो टर्न ओवर आपने जनरेट किए एज एन ई ओ यू और एज एन एडवांस ऑथोराइजेशन फॉर विच यू हैव ऑलरेडी क्लेम आई डी एस टी एग्जामेशन अंडर एफ टी पी सो बेसिकली इफ यू अंडरस्टैंड योर आई टी सी शुड बी देयर बट आई टी सी शुड बी देयर एक्सक्लूडिंग द इनपुट इनपुट सर्विसेज विच हैज बीन ईदर अक्वायर्ड अंडर एटी नाइन फोर ए फॉर डीम्ड एक्सपोर्ट ट्रांजेक्शन और अक्वायर्ड अंडर एटी नाइन फोर बी फॉर मर्चेंट एक्सपोर्ट ट्रांजेक्शन और एफ टी बी ट्रांजेक्शन same way when you talk about your turnover of zero rated supply of goods it will cover all your turnovers of goods without payment of tax excluding the goods which you have supplied under deemed export category under rule 894a for which refund has been brought or the goods has been exported either as a merchant exporter or has been exported under eou or ftp so that entire turnover will not be considered whether it is in total turnover or it is in turnover of zero rated supply of goods Think friend, everybody is clear with regard to concept के कौन से केसेस को आपको नेट आईटीसी या आपके रिफंड के फॉर्मूला से बाहर रखना है और अकॉर्डिंगली आपको रिफंड का कैलकुलेशन करना पड़ेगा सो दिस इज जस्ट अ स्मॉल अमेंडमेंट विच वॉज देयर आई थिंक इसके बहुत सारे पॉइंट जो एटी नाइन फोर बी के पॉइंट है वो एफ टी पी के अमेंडमेंट में भी हमने ऑलरेडी किए हुए तो आप वहां से उसको क्रॉस वेरीफाई कर सकते हैं सो आई थिंक एवरी वन इज क्लियर विद रिगार्ड टू दिस चेंज Still, there is one more amendment under the refund chapter. Let us try and talk about that, friends. One of the last point with regard to refund is the minimum amount of refund point. I think सब को ये पता ही है क्लोज पहले से कि 1000 से कम अमाउंट का अगर refund होगा तो आपको refund के लिए आप eligible नहीं हो. The minimum amount to apply for refund should be more than 1000. If it is less than 1000, तो आपको refund मिलने वाला नहीं है. Now concern comes in as how do we calculate that 1000 total? For example, मान लीजिए कि मुझे जो refund claim करना है, वो अगर मान लीजिए कि CGST और SGST की credit का refund claim करना है, तो मेरे पास CGST का 600 का credit है और SGST का 600 का unutilized credit है, तो मैं refund मांगने जाऊँगा, तो मुझे मिलेगा कि नहीं मिलेगा? क्यों? तो कि aggregate 1200 रुपया है, but अगर individual head wise देखेंगे, तो less than 1000 है क्योंकि 600 600 है. So am I eligible for refund or not? 
So, that is where a clarification has been brought in which says that minimum amount of 1000 shall be considered for each tax head separately and not cumulatively. So, her tax head may mujhe 1000 calculate karna hai. So, CGST is my separate tax head, SGST is my separate tax head, IGST is my separate tax head. So, when I apply for refund under each tax head, this amount has to be 1000 or more. For example, maan lijiye ke mera 1500 rupay ka amount aata hai IGST act mein aur CGST act mein 1000 1000 se zyada aata hai to I am freely eligible to claim the refund. But maan lijiye ke IGST act mein 1500 ka amount hai aur CGST aur SGST mein 6600 hai to I am sorry I can claim refund only with regard to IGST act 1500 mein CGST aur SGST act ke refund ke liye apply nahi kar sakta. Reason the minimum amount uh, uh, for refund uh, under each tax head shall be 1000 rupees. And again, the important aspect is this 1000 limit is not applicable when you are talking about refund from electronic cash ledger. So, cash ledger, se, see, yes, are each a credit ledger get refund. If you have cash ledger, se refund lena hai, to irrespective of amount involved, you can get refund from 500 rupees and 100 rupees. Ka bhi refund le sakte ho. So, that is the point which we need to understand. From electronic cash ledger, if you want to obtain refund, there is no limit, there is no balance limit. From electronic credit ledger, if you want to obtain refund, the minimum amount is 1000 under each head to be considered. So, I think this is the point which we are talking about under the refund chapter. I think refund ke liye jo sare points hai, wo humne one by one discuss kar liye hai. So, let us move towards the subsequent chapter because we are done with the refund chapter. Yes, friends, uh, now let us talk about one of the important aspect as sale of uh, goods in warehouse. Now, this amendment is actually a mixture for a lot of provisions to be very precise. Like it is going to affect the Customs Act, it is going to affect the GST Act import export transactions. See, let us first try and understand what is the uh, transaction I am referring to. And this amendment has been brought from 25th May 2018, so obviously not applied in November 18 exam, but is applicable for May 19 and is actually important point. Let us say we import certain goods from outside India and when we import that obviously we are supposed to pay custom duty. But as we are aware that we can store those goods in custom bonded warehouse without payment of taxes. So we have brought in a goods from outside India, we have filed an into bond bill of entry and we have stored goods in a custom bonded warehouse without payment of tax. Now, when we store those goods in a custom bonded warehouse without payment of tax, that is as of now without tax. Now, the important aspect is as and when in future uh, you, will, you wish to clear those goods, so you will file a counter bill of entry called X bond bill of entry. So, when you wanted to store that in warehouse, you filed into bond bill of entry, when you stored without tax and when you want to clear that, you want to file X bond bill of entry uh, on payment of tax, you can clear the goods. Now, the important aspect is when you have stored goods in warehouse filing into bond bill of entry over there, you have lot of rights the, that you can exercise. You can do packing, repacking, you can uh, take your customer to the warehouse and show goods for the purpose of sale. You can segregate your normal goods and damaged goods. Uh, you may do certain processing and lot of rights are available under I think section 64 uh, of Customs Act. The important part is when these goods are in warehouse, you do have a right to sell those goods also. So, when you sell those goods when they are in warehouse, what should be the tax treatment? Are we supposed to pay any taxes on that? So, that is where one of the first clarification was brought or first change was brought that when goods are stored in custom bonded warehouse, no tax will be charged on that. Rather, the tax will be charged only at the time of clearance of those goods from warehouse. I again bata raho. When goods have been brought to a custom warehouse without payment of tax, no taxes will be charged when they are sold in warehouse. The taxes should be charged only when the goods are getting cleared in domestic market. So, when they are sold in warehouse, there should not be any tax. Now, uske liye amendment GST Act mein already aa chuka hai. GST Act mein, mein precisely bata raha hu, uh, schedule 3, I mean like all of you are aware, section 7 ke saath jo schedule 3 available hai. Section 7 basically talks about supply aur uske saath jo schedule 3 hai, where they have talked about certain transactions which neither be called as supply of goods nor be considered as supply of services. So, schedule 3 mein jaoge, to wahan pe baut clearly ye point identify hua hai, ke when goods are sold in custom bonded warehouse, it is not going to apply any tax. 
So, uh, like from GST perspective, it is not going to be considered as supply of goods uh, or services. So, Schedule 3 very clearly says that if goods are warehouse, if it is sale, then it is not going to be tax at that time. Now comes a question is, what if those goods will be cleared in domestic market? So, when those goods will be cleared in domestic market, on that day, it is going to attract taxes. Now, when I say it is going to attract taxes, so now there comes two different issues. One, it is going to attract taxes under Customs Act. Another, it is going to attract taxes under GST Act also. So that is the point which we are talking about here. So this very clearly says that uh, in case of supply of warehouse goods, IGST shall be levied and collected at the time of final clearance of warehouse goods for home consumption. That is at the time of filing of X bond bill of entry. And the important point is, so when you, when you say that at the time of home consumption, taxes will be charged. Now comes an important aspect, that on what amount the taxes should be charged. So that is where subsequent point has been given. And the value addition accruing at each stage of supply shall form part of the value on which IGST would be payable at the time of clearance of warehouse goods for home consumption. So any profits that has been earned in between, so for example, I had imported in the warehouse mein store. I mean, when I had imported in the warehouse, the value was 100 rupees. These goods are in the warehouse and I will sell them. So, I will sell it to the warehouse, I mean, now I will sell it without tax. But when that person will be able to do home consumption of those goods, he is liable to pay tax. So, obviously, he is not going to pay custom duty, but he is also liable for GST. And that GST will be charged on which amount will be charged on which amount will be charged, we are discussing that it will not be the price at which I have imported goods, rather it will be the price at which he is buying those goods from me. So, if I bought them in 100 and I sold them in 120 rupees, so I think he is not supposed to pay tax on 100 rupees, rather he is supposed to pay tax on 120 rupees. That is the point. Read again friends, the value on which IGST would be payable at the time of clearance of warehouse goods for the, I mean sorry, the value addition accruing at each stage of supply shall form part of value. Value addition accruing at each stage of supply shall form part of value on which IGST would be payable at the time of clearance of warehouse goods. Further, niche clarification diya hai, pura formula de diya hai. Let us try and understand that formula, friends. As you can read the formula, it says, value for levying IGST in case of supply of warehouse goods shall be, two amounts are mentioned. Number one, transaction value. Number two, value determined at the time of filing of into bond bill of entry under section 14 of Customs Act plus basic custom duty plus any other sum levable under any law for the time being in force as custom duties excluding the IGST and GST compensation says ultimately whichever is higher. Now what do we understand by this friends? So this very clearly says that two type ke points honge. Ek mene goods import kiya tha. Maan lijiye 100 rupay me mene goods import kiya tha. To transaction value, jo B number ka clause hai, which says value determined at the time of filing of into bond bill of entry under section 14 of Customs Act will be considered as 100. Jo hum log section 14 of custom me derive kar rahe. Jiske andar place of importation tak ka transportation a gaya. Jiske andar insurance cost a gaya. Ye sari cost mila ke mera value tha 100 rupees. Plus you consider basic custom duty. Maan lijiye ke basic custom duty us product ke oopar applicable hota at the rate 10% rate. So then 100 rupees ka original value plus basic custom duty. Plus any other sum levable under any law for the time being in force as custom duties excluding the GST. So jo GST lagta hai under Customs Act that is IGST and GST compensation says. IGST is applied under section 37 of Customs Act and GST compensation says is applied under section 39 of Customs Act. Both this shall be excluded. But any other sum liveable under Customs Act, so probably agar protecting duty applicable hota hai to wo, agar safeguard duty applicable hota hai to wo, agar anti-dumping duty ya countervailing duty on subsidized articles applicable hota hai to wo bhi. Ye saare taxes ke saath, maan lijiye ke humare case mein usme se koi bhi extra duty applicable nahi hota hai. So humare case mein value rahega 100 rupay ka aur basic custom duty hooga 10%, yani 110 rupay ka aur ECSHEC ya SWS. Now since it's a time of SWS, so I think we should consider SWS only as 10 percentage. So SWS applicable ho jayega at the rate 10 percentage in the particular transaction. 
सो बेसिकली जो भी हमारा अमाउंट आता है मान लीजिए कि भाई दस परसेंट एस डब्ल्यू एस है ऑन टेन रुपीज तो अकॉर्डिंगली वी विल कंसिडर एज वन रुपीज सो आई थिंक माई हंड्रेड रुपीज विल बी वैल्यू प्लस बेसिक कस्टम ड्यूटी प्लस एस डब्ल्यू एस वो टर्न आउट टू बी अप्रोक्सीमेटली वन 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 रुपीज सो मेरा एक अमाउंट हो गया ये क्लॉज बी का अब मैं उसे कंपेरिजन में लेता हूँ एज ट्रांजेक्शन वैल्यू यानी दैट वैल्यू एट विच आई हैव सप्लाइड गुड्स टू माय कस्टमर सो मैं ओरिजिनल इंपोर्टर मैं सौ रुपए में लाया था वेयर हाउस में रखा था मैंने उनको गुड्स बेच दिया मैंने उनको कौन से प्राइस पे बेचा अगर मैंने उन्हें 105 पे बेचा तो ट्रांजेक्शन वैल्यू 105 है मैंने उन्हें 120 पे बेचा तो ट्रांजेक्शन वैल्यू 120 है सो एट वॉट प्राइज आई एम सप्लाइंग गुड्स टू देम इज ऑल्सो इंपॉर्टेंट अगर मान लो कि मैं उन्हें एक पे बेचता हूँ तो मैं वन कंसिडर करूंगा सो वन जीरो पर क्लॉज ए और 111 एस पर क्लॉज बी विच एवर इज हायर दैट विल बी कंसिडर्ड एज वैल्यू टू लिव आई जी एस टी एट द टाइम ऑफ होम कंजम्पन ऑफ दो गुड्स विच हैव बीन सोल्ड इन वेयर हाउस और अगर मान लो कि यही चीज मैंने 120 में बेचा होता तो 120 और 111 विच एवर इज हायर अकॉर्डिंगली दैट विल बी कंसिडर्ड एज वैल्यू फॉर द पर्पज ऑफ लिवाइंग जी so i think everybody understand this perspective that how do we actually consider the amount of those goods which have been sold in warehouse on which the tax will be charged at the time of home consumption friends acha friends ek aur point isme beech mein aayega wo ye ho sakta hai ki what if some only part of the quantity is sold so it may so happen let's say maine bahar se 1 lakh units mangwaye the usme se 50000 units main warehouse mein sale kar deta hu aur baki ke jo 50000 units hai wo main warehouse mein rakhta hu aur main khud uska home consumption karwaunga by filing ex bond bill of entry to jo 50000 goods jiska main khud home consumption karwaunga uske upar to main hi tax bharne wala hu aur uske liye to mera jo normal custom ka valuation hai wahi apply hoga बट जो 50,000 गुड्स है जो मैंने वेयर हाउस में रखे है जो मैं वेयर हाउस में बेच देता हूँ जब उनके ऊपर टैक्स की मैं बात करता हूँ तो उसके लिए मुझे क्या कंसिडर करना पड़ेगा तो उसके लिए मुझे कंसिडर करना पड़ेगा ये वाला कंसेप्ट ये वाला फॉर्मूला जहाँ पे मुझे जो 50,000 गुड्स को जिस प्राइस पे बेचा वो प्राइस और अगर वही गुड्स को क्लियरेंस uh, करवाए तो उसकी जो ओरिजिनल वैल्यू के हिसाब से जो बेसिक कस्टम ड्यूटी और जो टैक्सेस के साथ जो वैल्यू आता वो प्राइस विच एवर इज हायर के हिसाब से मैंने जिस बंदे को बेचा होगा उसे टैक्स कैलकुलेशन करना पड़ेगा सो so, ये पर्टिकुलर कंसेप्ट बीच में आएगा ओनली विथ रिगार्ड टू दो गुड्स विच एव बीन सोल्ड इन वेयर हाउस इफ प्रपोर्शनेट क्वांटिटी इज सोल्ड देन प्रपोर्शनेट क्वांटिटी के लिए ये कंसेप्ट एप्लीकेबल होगा अगर फुल क्वांटिटी सोल्ड देन फुल क्वांटिटी के लिए ये कंसेप्ट एप्लीकेबल हो जाएगा बट कीप दिस इन माइंड वेन गुड्स आर स्टोर्ड इन वेयर हाउस ऑब्वियसली नो टैक्स विल बी चार्ज एट दैट पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम बट टैक्स विल बी चार्ज एट द टाइम ऑफ होम कंजम्पन ऑफ दोज वेयर हाउस गुड्स तो आई थिंक एवरीबडी इज क्लियर विद दिस कंसेप्ट दैट इज द ओनली अमेंडमेंट विच हेज बीन ब्रॉड अंडर द चैप्टर ऑफ इम्पोर्ट एंड एक्सपोर्ट ऑफ गुड्स विच इज एक्चुअली रिलेटेड टू कस्टम्स एक्ट ऑल्सो एंड इज रिलेटेड टू जी एस टी एक्ट ऑल्सो सो आई थिंक एवरी वन इज क्लियर विद रिगार्ड टू द सेम Now, friends, with regard to amendments under return chapter, to be very precise, this chapter itself is not having a, a good weightage as of now. Reason is the uh, the uh, you know the problems that are there in current practical world. I believe everyone is aware that GST R one tha, uske upar se two A tha, two A will get converted into two, two will get converted into one A, one way will ultimately when everything will get settled, it will result into three. but that procedure which government has initially thought is as of now not working as we are aware of the point that gst r2 is not applicable gst r1 a is not applicable gst r3 is not applicable and to be precisely whether it will be made applicable or not that also is a big concern i think it has been already clarified that this reason this entire system has been abolished and a new system will be brought and when it will be brought nobody knows that so as of now the return procedures i mean is prima facie is a kind of a big issue for practical world also so whether it is applicable for exams i doubt you will find a single question with regard to return chapter except there can be a questions like basic questions gst r1 ke bare mein kuch details puch li jaye ya gst r let's say 9 ke bare mein jo annual return hai uske bare mein koi detail puch li jaye Uh, या फिर मान लीजिए जी एस टी आर फोर जो बेसिकली हम लोग कंसिडर करते हैं अंडर कंपोजिशन स्कीम उसके बारे में कुछ पूछा जाए सो देर कैन बी अ डायरेक्ट क्वेश्चन बट नथिंग टेक्निकल विल कम फ्रॉम द रिटर्न चैप्टर रीजन इज प्रैक्टिकल प्रॉब्लम्स टू बी वेरी प्रिसाइज नाउ 
what you need to keep this in mind is the only relevant amendment or I would say a clarification which is there for exams is uh, 2 is not applicable, 1A is not applicable and 3 is not applicable. A simple return called GSTR 3B is applicable which is a summary return which we uh, consider but since that has been brought in July 2017 I will not consider that as an amendment for May 19 exam. Yes, the only point is GSTR 1 ki jo applicability hai, jo initial phase mein monthly tha, usse quarterly kar diya gaya hai and that is continuously getting extended. So yes, one of the point which is applicable is GSTR 1, uh, humare attempt ke liye bhi aur practical world mein bhi mein batao, quarterly basis pe usse extend kar diya gaya hai. So uh, we will consider uh, based on turnover, if your turnover is up to 1.5 CR, then in that case you go for a quarterly filing of GSTR 1 and if your turnover is above 1.5 CR you go for monthly filing of GSTR 1. That is the only point that we need to consider as an actual clarification or amendment applicable for May 19 exam. Baki sari cheeze to as I have said GSTR 2 is not applicable, 1A is not applicable, 3 is not applicable, 3B is a summary return but it can't be considered as an amendment. So uh, more or less mujhe nahi lagta ke return ke regarding koi question aapke exam mein ho sakta hai. हाँ अगर ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा होगा तो भी direct question होगा GSTR one के बारे में कुछ बताइए या उसके ऊपर कोई question आ जाएगा कि GSTR one file करने की due date क्या है या due date भी छोड़ दीजिए कौन से लोग GSTR one file नहीं करते हैं या फिर GSTR one जो हमारा main return है वो हमें कौन से period के लिए file करना होता है monthly basis या quarterly basis या same question can come from GSTR four composition scheme के regarding या GSTR five है या six है six is for ISD or 5 is for as we understand it is for NRTP category. So, ye alag alag jo basic questions hai, jo direct return ke associated hai, 1k, 5k, 6k. Again 7, 8 we have already referred guideline ke usme baut clearly bola hai ke GSTR 7, 8 ke questions exam mein nahi aane wale hai. So, 7, 8 is again not applicable. Though practically 7, 8 is applicable today, but 7, 8 is not applicable for exams perspective. So, 1 ke liye direct question aa sakta hai, 4, 5, 6 ke liye aa sakta hai. 7, 8 ke liye again nahi aega, 9 which is annual return, uske liye questions poochhe ja sakte hai, in fact that is a hot issue as of now. So, you may find a direct question regarding GSTR 9, but from practical perspective return ke regarding koi bhi question exam mein aane ke chances nahi hai. So, keep this in mind. Uh, let us move towards the subsequent amendments. I think one of the point that we need to understand is TDS or TCS ke regarding jo amendment hai na friends, wo humme padne hai, wo bohat important hai humare liye. Actually speaking amendment kuch nahi hai usme, wo pehle din se law mein hai. But since it was not applied practically on any given day prior to 1st October 2018, 1st October 2018 hi wo date hai jab se humne TDS or TCS ko practical world mein apply kiya hai. So, because of that, November 18 तक वो कभी exam में आया ही नहीं है. But since from 1st October 2018, TDS, TCS provision has been applied practically. So, it is definitely going to be there in your May 2019 exam. And मैं तो ये मानता हूँ कि उसके लिए question भी आपके exam में दिखने मिलेगा with regard to TDS and TCS provision. So, I am बात करते हैं TDS, TCS के provisions की, which are very very important friends. Yes friends, now let us talk about certain amendments with regard to accounts and records chapter. Now to be very precise, there are only two things that we need to consider. One of them is obviously an EVA bill, which is obviously the most important thing that we need to consider as an amendment. But to be very precise, that amendment was already applied in the November 2018 attempt. So for May 19, okay that is important, but may not be that important as compared to November 18. Now over and above that as I said EVA bill ke alawa jo dousra amendment hai jo relevant hai jo hum pehle refer karenge that is this amendment which is where we talk about the tea, coffee and other business where actually what happens is uh, they conduct an auction of this product. So basically uska to gardening hota hai, I mean farming hota hai and then they pluck those tea leaves and then entire, gar I mean like, uh, I mean entire lot which has been plucked that will be ultimately sold through auction. So how do we? consider that uh, particular case because where do we maintain books of account? So I mean like generally what happens if you are a manufacturer you are required to maintain that at your principal place of business that means factory. Uh, you may also have a go down so you may maintain certain records at go down also with regard to the goods or uh, whatever de dealt from that go down. So general law is very clear that uh, whatever goods are related to whatever place of business 
all those documents in relation to those goods are required to be maintained at the respective place of business. But what about this particular issue where tea, rubber, coffee, other things are actually getting auctioned? So for that, the law is very clear. The warehouse where all these goods are stored and from where it will be auctioned, that shall be considered as an additional place of business. So let us say I own some tea gardens and whatever tea leaves have been grown, I've plugged that and I'm taking all of them to a warehouse and where I store that. So that warehouse may be my owned warehouse or that is a rented warehouse, whatever it may be, but I'm supposed to consider that as my own place of business and accordingly I need to register that as my additional place of business. Now it may so happen that when I'll auction goods from that warehouse, so there, is, there will be some buyer. Now he may take an immediate delivery and take goods with himself. The other option is he may also after buying will store goods in that warehouse only. If that is the case, then he is also required to declare that warehouse as his additional place of business. Now practically speaking, when you say that warehouse is declared as an additional place of business, so all the goods which are stored in that warehouse, document related to such goods shall be maintained at that warehouse. Because logical rule is that only, obviously documents maintain so all maintenance of books and everything should be maintained at that place so jo warehouse mein goods store karta hu main usi warehouse ko register karwana as an additional place of business now if that is my owned warehouse then obviously i can maintain all the books of accounts and all the documents over there but if that is itself is a rented warehouse for me probably it may become difficult for me to maintain all the documents and all the records at that rented premises so if that is the case now you know why why i'm saying it is difficult for me because logically speaking agar pura warehouse mein khud rent pe le leta hu aur agar wahan mein store kar raha hu na to i don't face any difficult but like practically hota kya hai pata hai main batau warehouse bahut bada hota hai uh, under this business i'm talking about particularly uh, there will be a huge warehouse and in which probably i'm taking only 10 or 20% size of that or 10 or 20% space on rent so I'm putting my goods in that warehouse, but only to the extent of 10 or 10, 20%. So um, probably there are five or 10 more people who are storing goods in that warehouse. Now it may become difficult for each of them to maintain all the documents with regard to goods stored in that warehouse at that premises. So this is a practical problem. So how do we resolve that? And that is where we think of an extra criteria, which is what this circular is all about, which says, that in such case, if it is difficult for you to maintain your documents and records at the additional place of business, then you may maintain that at your principal place of business. But for that, you need a prior approval. This is the point which I'm talking about. Whosoever is your jurisdictional officer, you need to communicate with him in writing that all the goods which are stored in this warehouse in relation to that the documents and other things have been maintained but have not been maintained at additional place of business rather they are maintained at a principal place of business considering the practical difficulty that is happening. So uh, prima facie rule is very clear you should maintain all this at additional place of business but logically speaking additional place of business pe ye maintain karna possible nahi hoga because I may not be the owner of that place I am just using it as a rented premises so practically it is difficult for me to maintain all these things over there so in that case I will be allowed to maintain all these documents and records at my principal place of business rather than at an additional place of business so when I am scoring that at my principal place of business I just need to communicate in writing to the jurisdictional officer and which is logically correct kyun toh ke us warehouse ka ek in charge officer hoga agar us warehouse mein mein kuch maintain nahi kar raha hoon aur uske regarding documents mein koi aur jaga maintain kar raha hoon at least I need to communicate to the jurisdictional officer Otherwise, what will happen? Uh, one day he'll come to my warehouse and he'll ask for documents which I'll not be able to provide. So he'll seize everything saying on the ground that you don't have proper documentation and other things. So section 73 and 74 and other aspects will, will be involved. So notice will be served and everything will come. So that should not happen. That is the only reason you need to communicate in writing to jurisdictional officer that yes, I'm maintaining all the documents, I'm maintaining all the records. It's just that they are not maintained at the additional place of business that is warehouse, rather they are maintained at the principal place of business. But that is a clarification. So I think clarification issue hua hai. Kab main clarification has been issued on uh, 8th of June 2018. So obviously it has been not applied in November 18 exam. This is a clarification or circular which has been issued while 47, circular number 47, oblique 21, oblique 2018. 
So I think everybody understands what do we mean understand by the uh, additional place of business for tea, coffee and rubber business or etc business and whether we are required to maintain the documents at such additional place or we are okay if the, we maintain the same at uh, principal place of business. This is the first amendment and this second amendment which is there over here is where we talk about TDS and TCS. Yes friends, we talk about TDS and I mean sorry, we talk about EV bill not TDS TCS, we talk about EV bill. So EV bill ke liye let us refer the entire provision ke what are the contents with regard to EV bill. Thank you.